Uh, good afternoon from Brussels. Um, for those who subscribe to my channel and have seen videos before, uh, I would say uh, welcome uh, to another uh, another video. Uh, to those who don't know me, uh, I'm an amateur physicist. Um, I've dug sort of deep into um, um, quantum mechanics, quantum electrodynamics, QCD, and um, my goal was to understand things. I don't accept, uh, you know, what is going around. You can never really understand these things. What I found is that um, what I call a realist interpretation of quantum mechanics is possible. Uh, we can we can imagine things, um, how they work, how things uh, interact, uh, fields, uh, particles, stable or unstable. In previous videos, I think uh, I was far too technical on these things. Um, they get views, but also get a lot of uh, reactions in terms of, uh, you know, we don't we don't really understand what you're talking about. So um, the objective of this one is actually to um, pick up on uh, some questions I had on previous videos. And um, I will do so by focusing on um, one aspect, uh, something very specific. It's the model of a proton. Um, is it the model? I won't say that. I will just show that uh, it is a model and um, uh, one of the driving forces behind my research has always been like since the Second World War, since, um, you know, I would say the heisenberg bohr uh, interpretation of, of quantum mechanics came up. You know, we focused on particles and thinking like, oh, these are like point line point like in infinitesimal small things that have uh, no dimension whatsoever, but they have a lot of properties, you know, spin and um, and high energy physics, you know, isospin and strangeness. And, and um, so actually um, my work has focused very much on trying to understand um, the structure uh, of elementary particles. And basically I focused on uh, the stable particles, the electron uh, and the proton. Um, Experiments show they have a radius, they have a magnetic moment, they have a lot of physical properties that should come out of, um, you know, classical equations, you would think, and, and they do. So um, I'm going to talk about the proton model. Uh, I said I'm going to stay away from the, the math a little bit, although it's not that simple. And in essence, you know, I wrote two papers, which I mentioned there. Uh, the nuclear force and, and quaternion math. Um, I will come to that. What is the nuclear force? Is the force inside of a proton different than the force inside of, a, of an electron? Uh, I, I think it's not fundamentally, and then of course it is, because a uh, proton is very dense, and, um, and I will explain why. Um, the other one is on the, yeah, the proton, the radius. Um, the title of the paper is on nuclear oscillations. I will talk a little bit about the nature of neutrinos. As we know, these uh, uh, come out of um, nuclear reactions, and uh, it's got to do with the structure of uh, what a proton really is. So you have my profile there. I said I'm not a professional. Um, I did some philosophy. I did a lot of economics, econometrics. Um, I have a, a doctor on this title, which means I started a PhD. It was in contract theory and modeling, but I never finished it. But I, I did get a lot of useful training in modeling. Uh, my research gate profile is there. You can also find me on academia.edu, uh, and, uh, on Vixra. Uh, I've got a blog, readingfeynman.org. Uh, I quote that below, because there I have two quotes that I like very much from, um, I would say, I have a lot of favorite uh, scientists, first and foremost Einstein, I think, <laughs> because I think uh, he was right after all. And uh, I think um, Einstein's uh, revolution uh, is sort of um, finished. And um, there's just a lot of people who refuse to accept that. Um, but Boltzmann said that uh, sort of um, if you want to dig into these things, um, that should be your objective. Bring forward what is true. Uh, what you think is true, uh, write it out so that it's clear, writing, um, that's in formulas usually, and then uh, defend it, that's what I'm doing here. Uh, Boltzmann committed suicide, uh, and the quote I have there is from another uh, scientist, physicist, Paul Ehrenfest, who also committed suicide because he sort of uh, 
um, also couldn't quite cope with what he called their unendliche Heisenberg-born Dirac Schrödinger Wurstmaschine Physik Betrieb. Uh, I still a lot of um, things that go on, uh, theories that are being uh, worked out and that can never be proven uh, qualify as that uh, sort of a Wurstmaschine Physik Betrieb. Uh, I will let you. Uh, uh, Google a translation for that. Uh, let's get on with it because I have a tendency to talk too long and uh, even if I have only a few slides um, I always talk like for an hour or two. So um, let's see if uh, this presentation if I can make it a bit shorter. Uh, these are some funny animations. Um, I show them because, uh, you know, we will be talking about a proton and uh, we will be uh, looking at a proton as sort of a, uh, an oscillation of a, of, of a point-like charge inside of the proton, uh, something very, very small, um, that rotates in, um, in two planes. And uh, I show here that, you know, we, we can imagine um, very strange things in three-dimensional space. In the uh, left-hand corner there, you see uh, a GIF file, uh, an animation. It is made by Jason Hise. He's a, he's a programmer, a video game programmer, a, a very successful one. And he puts a lot of uh, these animations uh, uh, out. And they're under the, uh, a Commons license. Um, it shows a 720 degree symmetry. You see you have that a rotating block. It's connected by some strings to the, um, to the outside world. You can think of these strings as uh, representing, I don't know, some kind of physical connection, a force of attraction with an opposite charge, or uh, you can think of anything. The, the, the thing is, this is not an isolated uh, uh, thing. It's connected with the world. And, uh, and you see it rotating in one plane only. Now you will see with every 360 degree rotation, uh, it does not come back to its original state. Just look at the blue and the green, because the, 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 the red strings, uh, they come back to the original uh, place in space, in 3D space here. But the blue and the, and the green one, you know, their orientation is, is different after every 360 degree turn. The thing is, after every, every after two turns, 720 degrees, uh, they come back to the same state. So you have a something real that has a 720 degrees symmetry, if we can call it that, um, which is real. And we don't need to imagine, um, you know, very complicated uh, or, or unreal um, 4D spaces or, um, um, you know, things that deviate from our, our classical uh, thinking that things happen in three-dimensional space and uh, when, when things happen when there is motion then um, and then time is involved and so we get a dynamic image of uh, of things that's why we call it 4d modeling but 4d modeling is not you know it's not four-dimensional space it's three-dimensional space with the uh, 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 time and so I would call it dynamic 3d modeling we've got the same for um, for planes, um, the the other animation of that that plane, you see uh, an airplane, has its own uh, symmetry axis or symmetry plane. I would say, you know, it has a front and a back and a left and a right. And then in the first animation, you see it moves in its own plane uh, only. Um, you see that from the green arrow. That green arrow stays uh, steady. So the rotation there is. Um, is actually just in, in, in one plane. We represent it in 3D space, but it's a, a rotation in, um, in one plane. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you see there that this plane is spinning around, but it's not spinning around in its own plane, in its own symmetry planes, because the green arrow, as you see, is, uh, is moving as well, uh, is rotating as well. Um, these are very nice things and they make you think about how, um, you know, how chargers um, 
could actually oscillate in space and uh, they make you think about yeah 2d and 3d structures of um, uh, that could or could not be suitable for uh, particle modeling um, I mentioned the website where I got that from it's a WordPress site lucky toilet uh, what a name um, I saw it I just googled it actually and I uh, I came on this. It's very nice because it's also um, apparently someone who's um, very skilled with working with um, programming software, Unity software, and working with quaternion math. I will talk about a little bit of that, that, that complex algebra that is really a very nice uh, mathematical instrument to, uh, to model rotations in, uh, in 3D space. Um, so yeah, put another figure to, to complete on that plane. You always see like you have a, in, in 3D space, you have a three possible um, axis of rotation. Uh, applying that to a plane, you know, a plane can rotate along, um, uh, well, its usual direction of motion, but when it gets into a tailspin, it's not no longer there. But when it moves normally, you know, it, it can roll uh, along the x-axis. Uh, it can make it turn, um, go up and down uh, so then you have these concepts of making a pitch or a, or a yaw um, so here I'm making publicity actually for for saying like look uh, if you want something really 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 easy you know just some general story in terms of you know can you explain uh, particles in terms of energy or in terms of momentum or, or this or that well I can't actually I need to sort of um, give you the the advice that uh, you need you need to dig into that that little bit of uh, math and uh, and the suitable math here is really you know complex algebra uh, imaginary units imaginary units are anything but 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 imaginary they are, um, they are rotation operators um so um i put a simple one you know when we only have a plane two-dimensional space on, on the right hand side you see there how that uh, rotation operators work we have a vector space here two-dimensional vector space where real numbers like plus one or plus two uh, in order they're just numbers on an axis and uh, a two-dimensional vector will be like plus one and then you know half the distance in the on, along the y-axis or one time the distance or two times the distance so we can um, every point in that two-dimensional space will be characterized by two numbers so plus one is really plus one and then zero on the on the on the y-axis and minus one is minus one um, and then zero on the y-axis and um, a rotation with the imaginary unit the imaginary unit itself i is um, is zero on the x-axis basically and one on the y-axis and minus e if we take the clockwise rotation so put a minus sign it's a mathematical convention if you see plus the imaginary unit you will rotate um, counterclockwise um, there also you need to respect the of course the convention am i looking from the front or from behind but that's uh, that's something that uh, uh, it, it's actually funny because how can you define the front and the back in this uh, in this thing we can only do it when we imagine like um, a charge going around and then sort of saying oh hey what's the magnetic magnetic moment what's the the magnetic field vector uh, and then we know that uh, the electric force is right-handed so then we, we we can sort of um, apply we need a physical convention and a mathematical convention to to define what is the front and what is the back even in simple things like that the, the thing i want to point out there is that in mathematics um, because they think of this as abstract spaces and i'm thinking it as a, as a real physical space you know, rotation counterclockwise uh, from plus one to minus one will bring you to minus one. And the rotation uh, clockwise from plus one to minus one will also take you to minus one. So it takes you to the same point. But in, in physics, it's really, you know, I would say um, we have Euler's number there right, to the power plus i, um, uh, I times pi. Um, that matters, you know, if you go along the blue line, you know, then I have spin in one direction, I would say. And if you go along the red line, then you have spin in the other direction. And that's something very funny when you when you are in an elementary course on quantum mechanics that they, uh, they don't see that. And then you have arguments in physics that say like, oh, well, you know, um, plus and minus uh, um, 
pi is, is a common phase factor in these wave function and we can just um, equate them cancel them well no we can't you're talking about two very different beasts and I, I think that's one of the reasons that people didn't see that wave functions were actually modeling something real, that spin is real, that it's not some abstract, uh, abstract uh, quantity, which led um, you know, uh, people astray and to all that ambiguity and uh, uh, all kind of metaphysical principles, uncertainty or whatever. Um, so basically, I am actually continuing on, on an interpretation or I would say an electron model, which for some reason after the Second World War, uh, you know, uh, movement was discontinued. There was a lot of good research going on, starting from 1905, when they discovered that electrons uh, actually had a magnetic moment, saying, "Oh, the electron, you know, must have a very particular structure. It must be some kind of ring current because a magnetic moment must be created by something." Uh, and, and so that that something must be a ring current. It's like a little magnet. So where is the current? Where is this? Where's the charge? What is the charge inside there? Um, what is that motion? And so that, that continued. Um, I mentioned Bright there also, a uh, famous fish. And Schrödinger himself, that's something funny. Schrödinger actually had found a very simple solution to Dirac's wave function. Um, a very elementary, the elementary wave function. He said, like, look, this is a very trivial solution to your wave function. And uh, it, it, it models. Um, um, I, I put it there, huh? the uh, the uh, the phi or the psi or whatever you want to call a wave function with a discrete letter. It's equal to a radius vector r. I put it in bold, and that radius vector we can describe it in uh, using complex algebra by a, a, a distance a, an amplitude, times that um, uh, complex number there, Euler's number uh, raised to the to a compl complex exponential plus or minus the imaginary unit times um, a phase factor, uh, delta. And you can write that out, so then you have, uh, because if you really don't like these complex numbers, it's that actually, A times a cosine, which you should also look at as, as a vector. A cosine is, a, is along the x-axis, so it points in a certain direction. Uh, plus or minus uh, cosine it has to be related to a phase, an angle. And then at the imaginary unit, uh, times, which is a rotation operator, uh, sine plus or minus sigma. The cosine and sine functions are in that sense really the same functions. There's just a phase difference uh, between them, which is linked to the fact, you know, we, we can show that, you know, if we rotate a cosine by 90 degrees, uh, we get a sine, um, a sinus function. So um, that algebra, uh, I already said that I would not make things complicated, and I am. But I, I just want to say these uh, these formulas, they mean something real. You should think of a, a radius vector, a position vector of, um, of some, and that position vector, vector of what, position of what? Um, well, uh, a charge, a point-like charge in Spain, in, in space, sorry, not in Spain. I wish I was in Spain. Um, because it's rather cold here in Belgium. Um, the, um, the, the, we think of where, where is that charge? And the, um, the idea of a particle actually is sort of like, you know, it, it's not a, 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 a point like thing itself. It has a structure inside there is, it, it's, a, it's a charge oscillation. And so the models I have are sort of what I call them mass without mass models, the motion of the charge inside of a particle. Uh, that gives the thing a mass. Mass is a measure of inertia. Okay, I made things complicated already and I'm not moving fast enough. Um, so I will move to the next slide. Um, um, if, if it is too fast, well, you can t take a break and then uh, I will give you a lot of references. So even if you understand only like 10 or 15% of what I'm saying now, don't, don't worry about it. Um, I will give you some pointers at the end of this presentation where you can say this, sort of like I really didn't understand what he said there, but then um, you can slowly read about it um, if you're serious about these uh, matters. So we're, we're thinking of a, a charge spinning around. Um, so particle for us is like, you know, there's a charge and there's an oscillation and, and it's regular. Right, because it has a frequency, uh, the Bruce, uh wavelength of frequency, I would say. Uh, so that, that corresponds to an orbital uh, frequency. You know, it goes around and it has a cycle time. Um, 
cycle time is the inverse of the frequency. F is uh, 1 divided by T. And, um, and now we have Planck's quantum of action. And that's sort of where people often say, like, uh, well, you know, classical physics breaks down uh, at this very small scales but that's actually pretty normal because you know Maxwell's equations are written um, in terms of uh, charge densities you know we have on average so much charge in, in, in that pocket of space uh, when you go down to the smallest of scale well there, there, there really is such a thing as a point like charge it's not infinitesimally small but you know at any point in time uh, it is it is somewhere in space and it, and it moves um, we will argue that the, the charge inside of a, uh, of, a, of a proton or an electron or its antimatter counterpart um, has actually no rest mass, so it has to move around. It's, it's kind of photon-like, and it moves around at the speed of light. And that's also where, um, you know, yeah, you need to keep track of what, what kind of field is it generating. We're talking a real charge, and we can no longer think about it in terms of, a, you know, charge density. So that's actually where Maxwell's equations break down, and then they don't. Once we combine them with um, uh, the Planck-Einstein law, uh, which says that basically, you know, when you're talking uh, a cycle of a wave, an electromagnetic uh, wave, or you're talking um, a superconducting current, or um, any ring current, really, any any very 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 small ring current, is that you know there's a law in nature that says that that. Um, that will pack one one unit of, of Planck's quantum of action. And what is that quantum of action? It is basically, you know, on the right hand side, um, the physical dimension of, of Planck's quantum of action is the same as a uh, as that of angular momentum. We know what linear momentum is, right? Linear momentum is, uh, you know, force that you apply to something over, you know, a certain during a certain time. And uh, and here the physical uh, uh, concept of action in German, it's called Wirkung. Uh, I found it a really nice word. is um, is actually combines dimension of a force. It's a force uh, during some time uh, over some distance, and so the angular momentum is is uh, is the same uh, physical dimension. So they must be related, and they are. Um, so Planck's quantum of action, when when you when you think of a point like charge going around. Uh, said that charge will have some angular momentum. Um, said it, its rest mass is zero, but it gets relativistic momentum because you know it moves at the speed of light, so it gets a, a relativistic mass. And so when it gets a relativistic mass and it moves in a certain direction, always a different direction because it goes around and around and around. So the um, the orbital uh, or the tangential vector changes all the time, and and there's a how we can decompose the force that sort of keeps it going around, that keeps the electron in place. But um, e each cycle of that, uh, because we're talking particles here, uh, matter particles, not not, uh, not photons. But for photons, you have a, a reasoning that's pretty similar for neutrinos as well, light-like particles. But I'm talking here about matter particles. You know, we, we, we can think of the Bray's um, uh, matter wave as uh, and, and the Bray's frequency as a, you know, that's the frequency of um, of that thing going around and around. That thing, the, the charge, basically, and uh, and Planck's quantum of action. You know, in, in each cycle of that point, like charge going around and around, in each cycle it will pack uh, Planck's quantum of action. What does it mean, packing Planck's quantum of action? Well, we can say that action is is a force um, over a distance. There's a loop, uh, a circumference of the uh, of the orbital. And, uh, and there's a cycle time. And so we can write that um, that's the, the nice thing. That's where you really need to understand these physical dimensions, the basic quantities um, that you will measure and that we can measure is uh, we can rewrite that uh, well as a force times a distance times a cycle time. Um, but you know, a force over a distance, that's what I have on it, that's energy. So we have a discrete amount of energy, uh, a discrete cycle time. And uh, we can uh, write uh, Planck's quantum of action, H, uh, there's the formula I put there, as sort of uh, the energy in each cycle times the, the cycle time. So I could put a, a delta E there and a delta T, but you know, the E is there basically the energy that, in, that is there in each cycle. It's something that goes around periodically, that moves, you know, there is an energy that, that is in there. 
um, and you know there's a, there's a play of potential and kinetic energy that we can explain but we said we don't want to get too technical but each cycle packs that amount of energy and you know times the cycle time we get Planck's quantum of action so that's a basic physical law that uh, you know any oscillation uh, any particle that is stable at least uh, will pack um, an amount of energy and will go around in a, a cycle time that you know when you multiply the two it must be equal to a Planck's quantum of action we, we can you we can also write it as the momentum of the charge. I said it has a relativistic uh, momentum um, times the distance it travels, you know, around that loop, uh, and that's actually the the wavelength, the, the Bray's wavelength. We uh, that's the mistake that was made. I think we think of some kind of linear wavelength. No, for matter particles, it's it's a loop, and uh, and a loop is uh, you know two times pi times the radius of the uh, of of that circular. Um, uh, loop so um, it's the inertial frame of reference that we're thinking that we're we're looking at the part that's not moving around I will come back to that but just where it is and um, so that wavelength we can divide it by uh, 2 pi and then we get what we um, um, uh, we, we, we get sort of a, a cycle time measured in, in radians that's a funny concept but it, but it's there um, and uh, we can multiply that with the energy so the Time divided, sorry, I need to correct my head. The time divided by two times pi gives you, you know, you can measure the cycle time in seconds, but when you divided it by two times p, you get it measured. How many radians per second um, do we uh, does that particle need to travel to sort of, you know, respect that cycle time? Um, I should have scripted this because <laughs> it's just kind of a funny explanation. I realize. But so the other the other thing is maybe more understandable is that you have the momentum times the distance that is traveled, which is the circumference of the loop. Uh, and uh, and if we divide that circumference of the loop, divided by 2 pi, then we get the radius of that of that little loop. And I will show now that um, that radius is the size. It's the radius of an electron. Um, yeah, tau, I should have not, because it, that's technical. Uh, when you see a tau like that, you think, oh, does it mean lifetime of particle? Huh? Because you're used to that. Well, no, we're talking electrons, protons, staple. There's, there's no such question as, as a mean cycle time. I just wanted to show here the power of this wave function notation, because what we can do, um, uh, I, I sort of thought about that. I'm, I got a, a little bit away from the ideas. An, an unstable particle, maybe that's sort of a change in something, an oscillation that dies out. Um, I, I don't think that's the case anymore because, you know, in, in high energy physics, you know, things break down suddenly. Um, particles um, fall apart, break apart, uh, or combine uh, in, into more stable um, constituents uh, or uh, more stable particles within the, the whole chain where you go from two stable particles that collide. You know, two protons. Think of two protons that smash into each other, and, and you know this firework happens. But then these uh, these things come recombine and, and make stable things again, stable photon, uh, or 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 another stable um, another stable particle. Um, so, but you could have an envelope function where you play with that mean time, etc. Um, I said I'm sorry for this, but I just want to show the power of that wave function math. And here again, I just want to stress that you know when you see a formula like this, it, it really models something real. Right? It's an oscillation in 3D space. You know the time variable is there, uh, and and the things you see in there are cycle times and Planck's quantum of action. That sort of you know really shows this is how this thing goes around. Um, next slide. Yeah, so quantum mechanics basically, uh, I said for me, it's all of physics, um, of course. I will just go down to the smallest of scale. And what changes is that when you go from the macro to the to the very, very small scale, I said Maxwell's equations break down, and, and they don't. Uh, it's just that we uh, we can't think in terms of uh, charge densities anymore. We really need to think of, uh, you know, where is a little point like charge? And then we have the Planck-Einstein relation that sort of uh, dictates um, what trajectories are actually possible um, so that's a complicated thing and actually I will I will not be long here but I, I, I this is a, an image I often use so that that black ring there is the electron uh, is the ring current model of an electron um, 
in our frame of reference, in the inertial frame of reference. So the electron doesn't move and it goes around and around and around. Now it goes around and around and around at speed of light. And, um, and that's sort of where you, um, this figure comes from uh, Di Tommaso and, and Fasano, two, two Italian researchers. And um, they allowed me to, to use it in any case, here's the reference. Um, they made this nice figure that when they would said like, okay, let's, let's now Im imagine that that point like charge, uh, it's no longer um, uh, with us. It, it's moving away from us or towards us. Uh, it's in a, it moves. So then, then what happens? Uh, then we need to sort of add a linear component to that motion of going around. Well, it goes that direction, and th that's what you see the spiral-like structure, Arch Archimedes screws. Um, it's actually also where he said, Jason he said inspired me when, when because he, in a lot of his computer games, you have these Archimedes screws. Uh, I think it was um, Gods of War or something where where he has these, and I thought like, hey, this is an interesting. Um, uh, geometric structure actually and so what what uh, and when i saw this so okay that, that that's really it actually when but your the, the the speed of light is absolute so um when when you insert a lateral motion a, a linear component then the the the, the oscillation um is still there and the charge still moves at the speed of light but that's where the wave function, which I write on, on the left-hand side, that delta, uh, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. One is really in, in the rest frame of reference. That's E0 at the bottom there, E0 divided by H. So that's sort of one uh, times uh, T prime. When, when this thing starts moving around, you have, first you have a relativistic energy that you need to measure. So the energy of the electron will increase because it has a kinetic energy because it's moving. So that's what we measure. And you can say, is that real, non-real energy? Of course, it's real energy. It's relativistic energy, um, but, but, but it's very real. So its energy increases. Um, and that's the, the argument of the wave function uh, becomes a bit complicated when you write it out, uh, because you, add, you have to add that, uh, that, that factor that takes into account the, the linear momentum it gets. That's the P. Um, and that's, that's not that um, angular, that's the point. It's really that linear momentum the electron as a whole is, is, is getting. And so I won't go into the detail, but that's where you see sort of when you write it out and you're, you apply the Lorentz transformation formula is that you see the, 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 the thing inside of the argument of the wave function is rel relativistically invariant. We can, you know, you can go from one reference frame to another and the, uh, it will stay the same. That delta, that phase angle, um, is uh, is the same. So um, that's the electron model. Um, I said it's complicated. I'm not actually now. I'm going to come to the very simple things. Where we'll, we'll probably what you want to hear is like you know, give us one or two equations and then explain, and everything comes out of it. You know, radius, magnetic movement, and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to do that in the next slide. But I just want to show you um, the the complexity that is behind. Uh, there again, I uh, I put the just to make sure that's something I repeat. Uh, we're talking about an, an oscillation in, in a plane, uh, two dimension in X and Y. Of course, that plane can sort of, you know, as that electron goes to space, move around and whatever. But basically, you know, the point like charge is moving in one plane and then the, the plane of motion can be, the, the, but the essential fundamental motion of the elementary particle, it's, it's a two dimensional particle, I would say. It's like a, a flat thing. Um, and there, uh, you know, I said our mathematics are going to say, like, oh, this is the imaginary component, this is the real component. You know, the, the real and the imaginary component are, are two coordinates, x, y, and, and then we have this special funny way of, um, of writing it as a, a sort of, you know, Feynman in one of his, uh, he said, this is like a clock, you know, we can keep track of where the uh, clock with only one hand. You know, and the hand goes around and around and around and goes so fast that we actually can't measure it. That's that's the problem um, that leads sort of to this uncertainty principle. It's not a fundamental uncertainty. It's just, you know, we don't know the starting conditions. This hand of that clock, the particle clock goes so fast. So we can never sort of see exactly where the charge is. And that's, that gives rise to the fact that you can never you know, really predict if this electron is going to interfere with a with a photon and when and, and all these kind of things but it's really a very 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 real you know this is a 2d space and an electron is like a 2d particle two-dimensional particle 
Um, so let us move to the, the easy formula. Now. I said, you know, something needs to come out of the model. And, uh, you know, my electron model is simple because it's a simple oscillation. Uh, I, I do uh, because I realize I should script my presentations a bit more. So I put a lot of text that I'm going to read here. But before I do that, um, you really get the electron um, radius. And magnetic moment we can calculate using Maxwell's equations and electron, but but the, the radius this is a very fundamental property, you know, the charge radius of an electron. You really get it out of this just uh, the Planck-Einstein law, which I which I write there. The energy is equal to um, h bar times uh, a frequency, and that's an orbital frequency. I said I think that's the you know, the thing I'm proud of, uh, I have a paper on that where I say like, okay, the Bray, when you read his original text also, he didn't talk about the linear oscillation in the beginning. He just said like, you know, we should associate some kind of frequency with a, with matter. And um, I thought like, okay, fine, a frequency can be an orbital frequency, it can be a linear thing. Uh, but for some reason, people thought it had to be linear. And uh, that's where there's a lot of hocus pocus around, you know, um, dispersion and uh, wave equations that don't make sense. Um, but um, so that's the Planck-Einstein relation, and the other one, C, is sort of the velocity of that uh, of that point-like charge inside of a, of a particle. It's a very simple mathematical form. That's the radius times the frequency also. So uh, we get that speed. Tangential velocity of something is is the radius times the orbital frequency. Um, that's really very basic secondary school physics. So I can't say more than that. So. Um, the omega there, that frequency is equal to the energy divided by h bar, and it's also equal to uh, c divided by a, uh, the speed of light divided by the radius. So um, putting things on their head, we can say the radius divided by c must be equal to h bar divided by e. And then we can do a substitution. Um, it's not actually necessary. We could write the, the radius of an electron in terms of uh, you know h bar energy and, and and, and, and that's it basically at C. Um, but uh, if you want to relate the radius of an electron uh, to the, the, the mass of an electron, well, there you have it. If a, a divided by C is equal to H bar divided by the energy, and then we have the uh, Einstein, uh, uh, Einstein's mass energy equivalence relation, the energy is equal to mc squared. Uh, then you have a divided by c is h bar divided by mc square and there's one c that goes away that um, you can cancel so you get then a uh, is equal to h bar uh, divided by mc and then you fill in the values you know, the mass of the electron the speed of light um, h bar and uh, you get about 386 i mean i could write all the digits here but uh 386 femtometer and it happens to be that this is exactly what is being measured in all these you know photon and other scattering experiments that involve electrons so you get a very precise prediction and um and that that's sort of the simple model where you know I want, but but how does it work then the 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 assumptions behind this are um you know this can all be interpreted very physically um so mass What's mass anyway? Mass is, is really, um, so this is a bit of a mass without mass model. This this thing, an electron gets, um, you know, it's basically energy. Yeah? It's uh, some a charge going around. You know, force has to act on a charge. So there's a force there and there's a charge and force keeps the thing in place. There's motion. So, and that, that energy, that motion has an inertia to, uh, you know, uh, any change into the, the state of motion of uh, that, that point-like charge that is oscillating inside of the electron. And that's actually what mass then really is. Mass is just where we're measuring the inertia uh, to a change in, in the state of motion of that uh, point-like charge. It has zero rest mass. Uh, it has a small dimension. I will come back to that. A very, very small must have because we, I'll come back to that. Um, but, but that's it actually. The, think of a spinning wheel, you know, the spinning wheel has some mass, but if you know, you give it a big twist, you feel in your hand in all kinds of forces and it has sort of an energy and it goes around and around and around the wheel. Um, you know, things start happening. It's sort of more difficult to move it. So there's an inertia to um, any change 
uh, that you want to bring to to its, to its current state of motion, which is that that rotation. So uh, mass appears really as something that uh, you know I don't need the Higgs boson to explain mass. No, it's just uh, a measure and. Uh, E divided by m will always be equal to c squared, so it's really proportional. Um, um, this this inertia to a change in the state of motion is is, is proportional to the uh, to the energy that is. Uh, so, but basically, it's about the energy of the oscillation of that point-like particle, of that point-like charge. I would say because the particle is the electron. So the, the big difficulty of this model is we talk about a particle and electron as a whole, and we we sort of talk about you know. A charge inside of that electron, and so on. The idea of a particle really is, is actually uh, a bit useless when you go to that level. It's sort of you talk about charges and fields and and the integrity of an oscillation. You know, it's sort of like a perpetuum mobile. Now the second thing I put there is that okay, let's think about this point like charge. If it would really have no um, size whatsoever. There's a number of things we can't explain. Um, uh, one of them is actually why, why sometimes there's hard scattering when we send photos on, a, on an electron. I know there's uh, um, inelastic scattering where the electron like seems to absorb the photon and sends a different photon out. Must be different because it has a different frequency. Some of the kinetic energy, um, you know, the part of the electron was addressed. Now suddenly it has some kinetic energy. So we have a collision there, but it's more like an absorption and re-emission. Of a photon, you know, all these kind of things, but sometimes we just have plain hard um, elastic scattering. The photon bounces on something inside and goes off at some tangent. And and the second thing we need to explain is that this this uh, it has a magnetic moment. I said an electron is like a mini mini magnet. So when we uh, we when we measure that magnetic moment, um, we we see there's a little anomaly in it and. Uh, um, in quantum field theory, you know, there's these endless loops and quarks and gluten and whatever it is, and, and uh, they try to sort of explain how, you know, self interaction. There's a lot of crazy theories that sort of say, okay, this is the anomaly. Um, I don't need that theory. I'm just going like, you know, when you, when you have a, a point like charge that is, 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 is smaller, a lot smaller than the electron itself. Um, and I'll calculate that. Then um, you know your effective center of mass, sorry, of charge. Your effective center of charge of that charge will not be quite that um, that 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 uh, on the circle. You know, so there will be some more charge outside, inside, whatever. I mean, I have a model for that, and that's where I, uh, you know, I calculate these things. Say, okay, this is the anomaly. Uh, I assume that a point like charge must have some. Uh, small radius of itself and I arrive because the anomaly you know you have the fine structure constant in there which is not a weird constant is combined combines known physical constants it's not uh, a god-given number or something that's another myth in, uh, in quantum mechanics it's um, that alpha that fine structure constant multiplied by the um, uh, the Compton radius, as I call it so the effective charge radius of an electron so it's alpha times um, a uh, alpha times uh, h bar divided by mc so that's the lorentz or thomson radius or um, the classical electron radius um, which um, which has been measured from experiments as well i know an electron has more than it's the funny thing also where it's difficult to say an electron is a particle yeah but you know is it the free electron or are we talking about a point like charge inside just a charge uh, 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 which is a property of the electron or are we talking an electron in some atomic or molecular uh, orbital then you know it, it appears as this kind of cloud um, so an electron has many shapes and forms depending on where it is what it does um, if it's messing around with a photon and uh, so we have uh, yeah, at least three um, uh, electron radii yeah, we have the, the classical electron radius the smallest one and then you know we think of it um, that charge that's a sort of a charge radius you could say uh, but the charge radius as it spins around that's where i put that uh, engine of an airplane you know the blades of that airplane there you know they, they spin around very fast we never because they spin around very fast when the engine is, is running at least um you can you can sort of say like okay it must be somewhere but where exactly go so fast and so that's the same thing so that charge spins around the velocity of light and um and, uh, and and that's the relation between the two, and that's sort of what's what's in. Um, well, I'll come back to that where where I, I then uh, 
So like, how, how does it relate to, you know, the mass energy equivalents? Well, it explains it, actually. Um, so think of this point like charge again. You know, it's often being described as, as sort of, you know, it's like a photon-like uh, thing. Uh, it's not a photon. Photons have no charge. The only thing that's sort of photon-like about it is that just like a photon, it has no rest mass of its own. It, it acquires a relativistic or an effective mass because of its velocity only and because it has no rest mass that velocity has to be c you know something that has no rest mass you know the slightest force on it you know will give it uh, an infinite acceleration and it will go to the speed of light and uh, and then i can show i do that in my papers the this effective mass you often have like a factor one over two or two like in schrodinger's equation um or when you talk about an electron propagating in a lattice you know this is one over two factor that's that's actually the because the effective mass of that point like charge inside of an electron, um, the, its relativistic mass is equal to exactly half the electron mass. I can show that classically and, and relativistically correct, and you can, I can use an oscillator model. Um, I, I do that once because that's where the airplane, and you see this is a nice radial engine. You have pistons, uh, uh, you know, uh, transforming the, the linear motion of the pistons to uh, something that goes around and um, and and you know these mechanical uh, models where where you think of an orbital oscillation as being driven uh, by uh, electromagnetic force electric magnetic field working all together to keep that thing in place or you think of it as some kind of an oscillator um, I hesitate to say it but some kind of um, you know perpetual modeling is some kind of elasticity but there's there's no elasticity of the vacuum, but but you, you can think of it in that way. You can have a mathematical model, a relativistic oscillator model that, that shows you that. Um, so what do I here? We showed this one over two factor is the same one over two factor which appears in Schrodinger's equation. The point to note here is that because it has no rest mass, its orbital velocity must be equal to the speed of light. So I'm still talking about point, which explains that that orbital velocity formula indeed c is equal to a times the orbital frequency. So we interpret the frequency omega as an orbital or rotational frequency, and and that is where we can uh, instinctively relate it um, to Einstein's mass energy equivalence relation. So to E is m c square. You remember maybe from your physics class also the energy in an oscillation, and I really think of something very classical here. You know, a mass on a spring goes up and a harmonic oscillator, they call it in physics. Huh? There's no damping, goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And and there's an energy in, in, this, uh, in this oscillation. With each cycle, each time that it comes back to the same point, you know, kinetic uh, and, and potential energy in that spring uh, get transformed into each other. When we compress the spring, there's a lot of potential energy. Uh, and then, you know, the potential energy goes down as it expands again and, you know, it goes faster and faster and faster. And then, you know, it goes past its its equilibrium point and then, you know, the, the, the spring gets stretched. So that means, again, a lot of potential energy in the kinetic, the velocity from the start goes down and starts coming back down. So the, you have a whole game of potential and kinetic energy there. Um, now that energy in an oscillation, and I make the reference there, you know, Feynman's lecture on harmonic oscillators, there, must, there, there are other textbooks you can Google. But the thing that comes out of the equations, you know, you think, sine cosine you can take two springs whatever it will always be the same thing the the uh, the energy in in each cycle total energy the sum of potential and kinetic will be proportional to uh, to the square of uh, two things the amplitude of the oscillation you know, it's a much wider uh, swing than uh, uh, the energy will be will be higher um and and how exactly well it will be Proportional, the energy will be proportional to the square of that amplitude, not to the amplitude itself. And then the second thing is it will also be a proportional to the uh, the frequency of the oscillation. But in the same thing, it will be the proportional to the square of the frequency. So that's where um, you know you have energy is then equal to you know some proportionality coefficient, and then you know a square times the frequency squared. And that constant of proportionality, uh, that's the mass factor. That's that's the mass. And uh, I put it there that like if you if you talk about an orbital um, oscillation, you can think of it actually as two linear oscillations, you know, working in tandem. 
think of a, a Ducati 90, you know, two cylinder Ducati, an engine. I love that motorbike. Uh, where the two cylinders work in a 90 degree angle and uh, and they make it go around is the most efficient it's more efficient than a harley davidson where the angles are slightly different and there you, you know you, you hear the noise that is typical there's some irregularity but in theory ducati engine 90 degree bank uh, angle uh, but we could of course have four or well, five or well, whatever something a symmetric setup um you will arrive at a formula that is uh, you know the energy is equal to uh, a square the amplitude of that uh, oscillation these linear oscillations um the frequency uh, and they combine to uh, the frequency is the, they combine to make you know linear motion uh, an, an orbital motion and uh, you get a mass factor that is equal to to m the mass if you only have one spring there's a funny thing in, in classical physics it's uh, m divided by two uh, and that's what we show once because we have a relativistic we have a relativistic oscillator here at speeds we, we must use the correct um relativistic formulas then that one over two factor that you have with a mass on a spring you know it disappears and so that e uh, is equal to mass times a squared uh times the frequency squared um you know bring the m to the other side and then we have e divided by m we know that's equal to constant c square uh it's equal to a square divided by the frequency so we actually we get our orbital velocity formula which is a plain mathematical formula out of you know the assumptions we have here that there is a point like charge going around it's sort of like a perpetuum model and that you know there's energy in an oscillation of that charge force working on it um you know so these these three uh, because we get this from three uh, equations uh, the planck einstein relation energy is equal to h bar times the frequency uh, the orbital velocity formula c is equal to and 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 the planck um, uh, sorry einstein's uh, mass energy equivalency is m square so the, the three are sort of when you think this model through and i have done that a lot <laughs> trust me uh, this may appear very mystical or Chinese to you, but for me in my head, it's like, uh, whoa, this is um, this all comes together, and, and Mars in these in this in, in this story is uh, yeah is is not a you know some kind of a metaphysical uh, substance uh, uh, something something deep. No, it's just the uh, measure of inertia, and uh, you know we, we could sort of forget about the mass a uh, mass concept and and think in terms of energy only, but we will still need. Uh, these these three equations or two equations. So um, I refer here to our um, the paper I wrote on the matter wave where I talk about you know these assumptions, the ring current model. I think the historical mistakes that have been made uh, because the Breuil originally he talked about sort of a, you know a particle having a rest energy and he said you know energy is um, it's an oscillation. Um, so um, his original formula is not uh, like like you see the Bray's relation now. But in any case, I won't go into detail. Look at the, at the references um, here, and uh, and that's it. So um, I'm almost at an hour, 50 minutes more, and I'm still not at my proton model. Now I'm coming to my proton model. The problem of paradoxes here. So I, in the beginning, I thought like, okay, fine, this is a an electron proton if it's an oscillation these formulas must must hold for both of them um this sort of a point like charge the only thing that is different is an electron is is a, and a proton a proton is much uh, is much more massive its energy is a lot higher uh, it's inertia to uh, moving around that, that's why a proton and, and nucleons are at the center of an atom and the electrons are at the outside uh, so we have a very massive object here so uh, but let's let's insert it and and see uh, you know when we calculate that value h bar divided by mc what we get and we got a value of about 0 0.21 femtometer and now the, the the experimentally measured there's a few methods and they have discrepancies and uh, they agree and could don't quite agree on on, on the on the on the measured radius i will talk about it then in a moment but but more or less you get a 0 0.21 which is actually one one fourth so H H bar divided by MC is 0 0.21 femtometer, and the the experimentally measured um, um, radius is, is is about 0 0.84 uh, femtometer. And uh, so I thought, okay, that's about one four. That I calculated. You know, you you get you get sort of within the uh, uncertainty of the measurements. 
you 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 get the um, the radius if you insert that factor four. But today you think like okay, you're inserting a factor four and everything is all, works all right. Now the, the the nice thing I learned from Feynman's lecture is like if the difference of your theory, uh, your theoretical radius or whatever you calculate, and what you actually measure is is like a factor of two or one over two or four or uh, the square root of two, um, then probably your model uh, is, is right on, but you're forgetting something, some kind of structural um, factor. And I thought like, okay, factor four, that's the same factor that appears you know, in the formula for the surface area of a sphere. Um, you know, the, the surface area of, of, of a sphere, three-dimensional object, is four times pi times r square, the radius of the of the sphere, and uh, so that's a factor four there. And uh, we know the surface area of a, of a plane thing. We think the electron is like more of a, a two-dimensional structure. The surface area, if I can call that, of our point-like charge going around, um, is um, is pi uh, times r square. So there's a factor four there. So it must be somehow the, the same one. But somehow the same one, you know, how do you translate that then? And that's that's where I thought like, okay, fine. I have for my electron a model where, you know, I have, uh, uh, you know, two linear oscillators working together. Uh, I said like a Ducati engine creating orbital motion in, in a plane. And that plane can, of course, can rotate and whatever. But, you know, the motion is in that plane. It's like the, these animations, the computer graphs I showed you from that airplane that is rotating in its own symmetry axis, um, you know, it can go around, but um, in the second image showed that, you know, when it starts moving outside of its symmetry axis, you know, we, maybe that's an active uh, oscillation as well. It's not just some random uh, plane in free fall. No, maybe there's an active, really an, an oscillation in, in the third dimension. Of course, we don't have a mechanical equivalent for that. You know, Ducati engine is an easy metaphor, I would say, for an electron. You know, two cylinders working in, in, in tandem and creating that, that motion of that charge. In three dimension, you know, you can't, you can't think of an engine. Maybe we can. Uh, maybe you're more creative. Where, where we have like uh, oscillations in, in the three dimension, the x axis and one along the y axis, and at the same time, it's like oscillating in sideways as well. But if we do that, um, theory uh, where we don't have the mechanics of an engine you know the charge moves around we we have uh, it's oscillating in two planes or in three dimensions two uh, one, one plane x y plane and the x z plane or a three dimension x y and z um, then you know we have um, uh, i mean we, we must apply the uh, what is called in physics the energy uh, equipartition theory. You know, the total energy of that oscillation, and it's something that comes from kinetic gas theory also, is like um, the energy will be spread over the, the degrees of freedom in, in, in that system. So half of the energy will be, you know, in one plane and uh, or in one orbital oscillation here in this case and, and the other one will be in the other um, orbital oscillation so we have two uh, they oscillate with the same frequency you know we could distinguish uh, an omega one and an omega two for one plane and one but the frequencies should be the same uh, it's just the energy that it packs and, uh, and also the uh, angular momentum or you know uh, Planck's quantum of action will be spread in half, uh, neatly in half, over the, the, the two degrees of freedom, I would say, in that system. And that's where you um, you, you get a bit of a difficult, um, um, and maybe it appears a bit artificial, but um, your Planck-Einstein relation, I, I think that's the simplest one uh, to start with. So the energy divided by two is now equal to um, h-bar uh, times... Um, uh the orbital frequency so instead of the total energy of the proton being equal to h bar times the frequency you know we divide the energy because it that h bar times two you know each of the two uh, planar oscillations will pack one unit of um, of uh, uh of physical action planck's quantum of action uh, uh, just so um and the energy that is in there uh 
is half the total energy of it because in the other direction, you know, that, that's where the other half of the energy goes. The uh, the orbital velocity formula stays the same, you know, the, the velocity sideways or this way, you know, the velocity of that thing uh, as it moves around on the, think of the surface of a sphere, you know, its orbital velocity will be C and that's equal to the radius, huh? the distance from the center to, to the, the surface of the sphere times that orbital frequency. Uh, the difficult one is uh, is the um, um, because that sort of solves my problem by half. I get a radius that is then uh, you know two times h bar divided by mpc, so I need to, to be four times. So I need to add a um, another factor too. And um, that's that's a funny one, and I'm still struggling with that. Uh, I don't know if I will ever solve it. But in Einstein's relativity theory, his original paper uh, from uh, 1905, 30 June 1905, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, um, there's that, that's a complicated paper, right? It's sort of a heuristic argument from various I he shows ESMC square. Um, on page 21, page 22, which I have to reread, he actually talks there about an electron, and I think he talks about the charge because he thought of an electron as a point-like thing and applies a Maxwell's equation of having a transverse and, and a longitudinal mass. So he gives sort of energy some kind of directional concept. Um, because to make a long story short, um, you know, I, again, I need to distinguish between like, um, you know, the different two energies, basically, the energy of, of the proton as a whole. And then, you know, the energy in sort of, uh, that is in, in one, uh, uh, oscillation in one planar oscillation and and in another pl plane um, and, and that's where you go like the energy must be equal to mc square um, divided by two when you apply all that reasoning about a point like charge with no rest mass going around um, you know traveling around spinning around um, uh, you know acquiring an effective mass and and this and that so I would need to spend more time of this, but it's um, um, it, it must be this. I mean, that factor two, uh, where we're basically the energy equitic partition leads to these these two new formulas, where the energy is two times the h bar times the frequency, and where the energy is also equal to you know c squared divided by two, and then we do the same thing, you know, from the the, the bottom two, um, the frequency is equal to the energy divided by two times h, and uh, the frequency is equal to c divided by uh, by a. So a over c must be two h bar divided by e, and um, and then we the energy we substitute it not by m c squared but by um, the energy divided by two. So from our expression two h bar divided by the energy, we get you know that must be equal to four times h bar divided by total mass of the proton uh, times c squared, and and we get that formula. Now you will say um, that is kind of numerology. Uh, I got that criticism. Um, I, I do not. I, I don't think so. Um, uh, the thing is, I need to work the math for that. But I said I have a different day job. Um, it's too spot on to um, to be wrong, um, and it makes sense for me instinctively naturally although i would need to work out you know three dimensional relativistic oscillator what are the energy concepts involved there you know kinetic potential uh, but yeah if we have two degrees of freedom in the system where's the potential where's the kinetic in that it's much easier for a proton model to sort of spell that out uh, for an electron model but for this proton model that that's what we have and i cannot say much more about that I know that there were some critical questions on where, where does this come from. The thing I can say about it is that actually originally I did not have these simple formulas. I was thinking more like, okay, we have a measured uh, magnetic moment of a proton. Uh, the uncertainty around it is, is quite large. That's just also where there is an anomaly in the um, in the magnetic moment. We also think, okay. We should be able to explain that that point of charge inside the probe, but it's already so small, huh? 0 0.841 femtometer uh, versus 380, what is it, 86 femtometer? It's um, 
It's a lot smaller than an electron. So a proton is really something very, very small, very dense. Um, and that's actually the other thing I want to point out. Like, you know, it doesn't surprise me that proton mass is clearly different than electron mass. We explain it by the same force. You know, an electromagnetic force is working on, on the charge, but we inject that, that mass formula. And in the end, proton has, you know, it's a proton mass, not an electron mass. And that's also where I feel like that, that different, that factor two in, inside of the uh, uh, this, this revised, or what would you call it, the, uh, the mass energy equivalence relation as, as it applies to a proton because of its three dimensional structure. Uh, I, I don't feel that's inherently wrong. Um, But uh, to continue on the story is actually, you know, I was calculating backwards from um, ring currents. And if you have a three dimensional ring current, you know, it spins around, you know, your magnetic moment will be different. And then, you know, you need to apply like actually square, uh, uh, a square root of two and etc. My original model in the paper, I'm going to refer to look at it. I basically explained the, the proton radio mass, the 0 0.841 femtometer on um, what I will show now. Here, that's the formula I used. The uh, two times uh, the magnetic moment. Uh, what? Well, it's actually the yeah the magnetic moment, which is equal to the um, uh, angular uh, momentum divided by the charge uh, QE. I mean the, the elementary charge. The charge of a proton and electron is the same, so that E is the elementary charge, it's not the electron charge times C. Um, so actually, I should look at it. I didn't prepare that, but but you know, it's a reasoning in terms of a magnetic moment, angular momentum, uh, but for a, applied to a three-dimensional thing using the measured values, uh, general magnetic ratio. Actually, I should I, I should mention the paper there. The um, it's quite a derivation, but I arrive at a formula four times h a bar divided by mc based on a reasoning on magnetic moments, angular momentum, uh, general magnetic ratios. As measured from experiments, not on sort of the um, uh, the easy derivation I did, like you know, two times the energy is mc square. Um, the energy divided by two must be equal to h bar. So I feel like uh, you know, if you don't believe what I said before, I'm sort of you know getting the the proton radius directly out of that oscillator model, as I call it. Then uh, well, go with this model uh, because um, I get. A result uh, is just like 10-15 uh, pages um, of, of really calculations uh, that require you to have a deep knowledge of uh, of electromagnetics and uh, Gauss law and uh, and uh, Faraday's law and um, electric constants and, and all these kind of things. You know, it's, it's it's not it's not rocket science. Yeah, we're talking a ring current, but we're talking a ring current in, in like three dimensions, and you know. The, it is a more complicated calculation, and it gets you exactly the same formula four times h bar divided by mc, uh, without uh, you know deriving it directly from uh, the mass energy uh, equivalence relation and the Planck Einstein relation. So that's the value. I, I write it out there. Um, you know the the, the p rot uh, as they call it, the proton radius lap uh, within the Jefferson lap. Uh, that was the last measurement. Uh, was um, 0 0.831 femtometer plus an uncertainty which they call statistically and then an uncertainty which which they link to the their method of measuring it i should look it up but it's uh different um so it's not within that uh, 0 0.831 plus minus 0 0.007 femtometer interval but it is within the wider interval and within the uncertainty interval of the, the proton radius is equal to 0 0.831 plus or minus that 0, 0 0.7 and then the systemic radius which is how you measure it to use um uh, which which kind of scattering method you use? Uh, it's within the Kodata value, which I write down, and it's actually very close to it. You see, 0 0.8413564 femtometer, and the point estimate, the Kodata value, which also uh, comes from other experiments, not from pre run is 0 0.8414. So I would say the, the theoretical value I get is. Uh, <laughs> is 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 according to Kodata, it's this is the right value. It is the experimentally measured value because they make that sort of average and they attach weights to um, um, the various experiments measuring it. So I believe I'm on. 
the interesting thing, and that's something I'm going to say now about, okay, the proton, nuclear force, a strong force, you know, that's what we say. I think that's a bit of nonsense. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know that in the, before after, there, was the, there was this Yukawa formula for the nuclear potential. Uh, it says, okay, there must be a strong nuclear force inside of, a, of an atom, and then they, they established a sort of theoretical uh, uh, range for it. And at h divided by uh, the mass of the proton times c factor is actually that range. Uh, my thing basically on the, on this question is: the, is, is there a difference force inside a proton or a nucleus? I, so I I think the nature of the force inside of a proton is essentially the same as that of the force inside an electron. It is electromagnetic. It's just the mode of oscillation is um, is obviously very different. It's a three-dimensional oscillation of, of, uh, of a point-like charge. And uh, for some reason, that probably can never be explained and probably does not need to be. It, it's much denser. Yeah, a proton happens to be very different than an electron. It's more, it's it's massive, it's smaller. It comes with a, with a totally different mass factor. But I'm going there like, you know, what more questions should we have on this? Um, I don't feel the need to explain both an electron and a proton in terms of you know something that is uh, quarks or something. So, no, no, we have protons, we have electrons, we have a model, um, an electromagnetic theory, and um, you know, charge-like, and, and there we go. And so uh, we can apply the same uh, descriptive math to uh, well the same for uh, uh, the wave function of. Um, of an electron would be h bar divided by uh, the mass of the electron times c times you know others number uh, plus or minus e times uh, the energy of the electron divided by h bar times its proper time for the proton because it's a two-dimensional oscillation we have uh, we must use <coughs> sorry <coughs> have a bit of a cold um to imagine Oh, sorry. Two imaginary units, um, I and, and, and a J. So if you have a rotation operator I that works on one plane, the other one per convention must be J. And again, we have we must have the right conventions for the reference frame. Uh, we must combine the, these with, with, our, uh, with the fact that the, the electromagnetic force is right-handed. Now we can use the plus or minus sign to model a proton like we are doing here. Uh, but also have you know the spin direction of that on the i plane it will be you know that way or that way. And again, you really when you when you define that you need to say oh I'm looking from behind back and which electric how is the proton moving as a whole? What is my my coordinate frame must be right-handed. Um, the ring current you know its magnetic moment will be in this direction, not in the other one. So that will define what you what you define as the front or the back uh, looking. Um, um, but that plus or minus is then the spin in one plane, and uh, and the plus or minus j is the spin in, in, in the other plane, and then horizontally we we'll call the one the other one the vertical, and then um, so we have that that spin. Uh, the chirality of a proton is is obviously much more complicated than um, or the spin um, than uh, the spin of an electron, uh, and that's something also I, I see that in, you know in, in the way you you're being taught about um, quantum mechanics. Oh, spin is spin. It's up or down. Well, no, you know, spin has a structure. It's related to the. the uh, that's why I, I prefer to talk about chirality. And it's also when you hear about CPT symmetries and, and charge parity and, and uh, the time symmetry, it's just like, oh, <laughs> uh, don't oversimplify the discussion. Think about what you are talking about. Um, but but so that's my formula. I'm at a uh, one hour uh, uh, thirteen. So I, I will not say more about it. I will just um, um, point to some um, publications, I think, or maybe there's, a, there's another slide. Uh, let me move to the, the next slide. Let's see what I had sort of thrown on paper. Oh, yeah, I did, but these are the, I've, I've got about 30, uh, a bit more than 30 papers. Um, and I, I glad, I mean, there are different levels. Let me start from the bottom. I sort of jokingly uh, started rewriting uh, Feynman's lectures a little bit. So the, on the, at the bottom, you see there at researchgate.net, uh, lectures on physics, uh, chapter one, uh, quantum behavior. It's probably hidden by my face, but that's the title. Lectures on physics, 
um, chapter one uh, quantum behavior. And and that's where, uh, you know, you can go that and, and see that the electron model and there's a lot of nice stuff on there. And that's also where, you know, when you start thinking as electrons and protons, not as some abstract a zero dimensional uh, thing, but as something that has a structure, you know, a spin with its fields, um, then uh, you know you can you, you can then sort of look at uh, oh oh fine an electron interference experiment, you know the two slit experiments and electrons interfere with the near you know it, it makes a lot more sense. It shows how complicated the thing is because forcing the electron through the through one or two slits at the same time you know that all that stuff uh, honestly when you think about the structure and, and the thing going one way and 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 the field that surrounds you know a particle uh, and how it interacts with the material uh, of which the slit is made you know actually one one slit interference an electron interfering with itself so it is much more interesting but there's no mystery that's what i want to say and it's the same thing with max zender uh, one photon interference you know there's, there's very logical explanations um for these things as soon as you start thinking that you know that spin first uh, don't oversimplify it uh, think of what it is think of what a light particle is think of what a photon is we don't have a, an oscillating charge in there no but we have an, electro an, an electromagnetic field vector. Uh, we have an electron magnet. We can decompose it. Uh, a photon can be, you know, circularly polarized. Can also be linearly polarized. So circularly linearized, polarized with photon. Circularly polarized photon. We can think of it as being made up of two linearly uh, polarized waves of photons. That's where a photon has three quantum conditions: spin up, spin down spin zero theoretically Feynman would say no one but yeah linearly polarized waves you know spin zero you know, things do split up and come together and recombine in strange ways very strange ways but not uh, ways that uh, that can't be explained so let me go up uh, the charge concepts of charge elementary ring currents potential energy and field oscillations yeah that that's an interesting one i think which i should mention here you will say um you know there's really a spinning charge inside of an electron or a proton we, we should have field oscillations around you know the electrostatic potential you know it is we have an electron and it has an electro electrostatic potential you know you bring another charge in and will be if it's the same charge uh, they will repel each other if it's the if it's an anti electron uh, and a positron they will attract each other so there's this electrostatic potential there should be small variations you now what i argue in that paper is <laughs> that's actually what i'm saying well, the maxwell's equations do break down in the sense that uh, you know a, a, a field oscillation that is belong that threshold of uh, of Planck's quantum of action uh, we can't measure it uh, so we won't see it uh, and uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying the, the discussion because this, this is a rather long paper but it shows so where well yeah you have uh, oscillations uh, above the Planck scale and then yeah we can measure these things below the Planck scale no we think this is going on and it's just um, you know in the end it is a model so I, I do address some some pretty deep questions in that paper um and i invite you maybe i'm, I'm maybe uh I'm, maybe my reasoning is not great uh i I've, but i think it it explains everything neatly uh these kind of questions like why don't we count why can't we have why don't we measure small variations uh in uh, in the electromagnetic field of an electron if, if there's really sort of a spinning charge around it so um the, these are um not philosophical physical hard philosophical questions uh, physical questions uh which i answer there um i have a whole series on you know because we have charge of course then so we have fields um so the concept of a field what is it you know photon basically what is a photon how should we imagine it so that's there uh i combine both a little bit in sort of an interaction theory lectures on physics chapter five moving charges electromagnetic waves radiation near and far fields have a look uh, the best paper for an introduction is probably my paper on uh, the Broglie's matter wave. Um, the the Broglie's, uh, it's the Bray in proper French, not the Broglie. Uh, it's a bit of a Swiss South French pronunciation. Um, 
but where I say what I say, like why why should that? It, it, he, he was a genius, and Einstein recognized that to associate a frequency with a, with, a, with elementary particles. But why should that frequency be a linear uh, frequency? Why should the oscillation be linear? So I talk about that. The paper is a little bit technical because I show why you know wave equations. Then uh, we have wave functions, we have wave equations, Dirac, Schrödinger. Um, Etc. Why they uh, you know, this idea that uh, the wave function dissipates or collapses when we do the measurement and whatever it all doesn't make any sense when you think of the way I think about particles. Um, they are represented by a wave function, just one, not sort of a superposition of many wave functions with slightly different frequencies that then combine. You know, you really don't solve these problems. Uh, uh, if you don't think outside of the box and think indeed of the frequency as some kind of orbital frequency. So uh, go there for a um, uh, tough one. It's my most popular paper, I think 10, 15,000 downloads, which is a lot or not a lot. I hope I'll get more. Um, the interesting thing then, uh, lectures on physics chapter eight, one of the, the later ones is a pair production. This is something fascinating in high energy physics. You know, gamma ray coming into the atmosphere, um, you know, we, we seem to see these things, uh, and I say we seem because I'm not convinced well, we see everything. Maybe we just see what we want to see. Is that a gamma ray has this potential of um, creating an, a pair of a, a charge and an anti-charge, an electron and a positron. Um, the, the thing that strikes me is it always happens in, um, at least in the early cosmic ray experiments, you know, the gamma ray hits a particle and uh, these particles are complicated, you know, uh, complex molecules, uh, oxygen. Um, well, oxygen is not a complex molecule, but, you know, the, the, the stuff inside there and a lot of things happen. So I'm, I'm sort of like going, maybe there was some sloppy accounting. Maybe the charge comes out of the nucleus of some particle and uh, and you have these these, these pions and, and DK and unstable particles. So maybe maybe there's something there. Uh, to be honest, it's still a mystery. It's the only mystery for me that is there. In really very high energy physics, you know, we have this very neat separation between charge and fields. And uh, it's the only thing you need to know and how they behave um, to explain everything in low energy physics. But in high energy physics, yeah, pair anti-pair creation. Uh, production, pair production. Um, there's also experiments like the E144 uh, experiments, which shows that uh, the same happens when, um, um, you know, they can have actually pair production outside of um, or, or far away from. You know, but, but then we have like an electron beam that is there and and that I really also like a little bit like, yeah, maybe something turns in sound. Maybe the accounting is a bit sloppy there. I said that that's uh, that's one I, um, I, I really suffered and um, but I, I don't want to suffer like uh, Boltzmann did it or uh, or Ehrenfest. So yeah, that's the only mystery that's left for me: pair uh, and uh, pair production and pair annihilation. Is it a nuclear process or is it really? If it's a nuclear process, then um, you know when we take full picture, then charge does not is not being created out of nothing, and, uh, and the annihilation also is not sort of a destruction where. Something was there, a charge was there, and suddenly there's not, there's nothing there. Then it's just, you know, there must be something with the accounting. Um, the other one on top there, on the that's the one I explain now in as simple as a uh, language as, as possible on the proton radius, nuclear oscillations, and there's also some remarks there on the nature of neutrinos. You know, if if a proton is like a three-dimensional oscillation. Uh, you know, we have that electron and a photon, a two-dimensional oscillation. We think of a photon as sort of a the electromagnetic field vector is like spinning in one direction. But a neutrino must have must also be like a light like particle, but then with a sort of a three dimensional oscillation of its uh, of the electromagnetic field vector, because I think it's the same force uh, that, that must explain a neutrino. But that could explain why, you know, if there's an oscillation also in the direction of motion of a neutrino, why maybe that explains what they found recently is that, you know, neutrinos probably have a very, very small apparent uh, rest mass, unlike photons. And that's why they may be, I mean, these experiments need to be confirmed, but they seem to be solid, where a neutrino probably does not quite reach the speed of light and, and therefore must have some very, very, very tiny rest mass. And I explain it there because, I said, well, if you have a proton, three-dimensional, uh, oscillating in all directions, three, the three uh, dimensions of space, physical space, then a neutrino probably also must 
um, you know, have have a structure like that, not in terms of a charge oscillating, but in terms of the electromagnetic field uh, on the point where it happens to be. Um, you know that that must be a, there must be a rotation also there that in the direction of motion uh, creates some um, some apparent inertia in that direction and that means um, that means that it has an apparent rest mass. The last one is the most uh, funny one I did uh, an anti force to explain dark matter. It always intrigued me that you know the electromagnetic force as we know it it's right handed. There's a phase difference of 90 degrees between the electric and the magnetic field factor. We know that, but it's the magnetic field factor lacks the electric field factor. And you know you can say okay that's relativistic because if you go to another reference frame, but it will always be the same thing. You have a minus 90 degrees uh, phase difference. And I think like maybe. Uh, it's like Dirac when he said, you know, my wave equation would also work for positive electrons, and then they found it. Maybe I've got like the math and the way we think about things, you know, allows for an anti-force, uh, and that would be a left-handed magnetic force. And uh, if if we would have electrons, positrons, or whatever, um, photons, uh, any particle that we know, but imagine that they would be driven by left-handed force, you know, the signature, time, space-time signature of these things would be very different. And they would not interact with our right-handed particles. Right-handed in the sense that, that you know, there's a right-handed electromagnetic force that explains their structure and properties and whatever. So if we, we can imagine a universe with a left-handed electromagnetic force and they, um, you know, they wouldn't interact. It's like um, you have a door and you have a key that fits and so you open the door you close the door it fits uh, uh, and suddenly we have the same key but it's mirror image and so suddenly we go like well this door was made to work with this key <laughs> we can't we can't fit it in it, it, it doesn't match and that's sort of where you know in that paper i am um, i think it's a rational explanation it doesn't require us to invent a whole new particle zoo uh, and, and very weird new uh, particles, you know, there's like uh, these axons and, and, uh, and special bosons or whatever um, that that we uh, that are currently being, you know, well, we must find this to explain dark matter. I'm going like, no, just think of a left-handed electromagnetic force, and uh, you know, you have an explanation of why it is there because um, it's mathematically, physically possible, and because why, uh, well. It's in the laws of nature, um, and the uh, and you also have an explanation of why that matter, be it matter particles or light particles, uh, dark uh, particles. I said it, we would have exactly the same world eh, with with matter and antimatter and electrons, positrons, but but it would they would be dark electrons and, and dark positrons, and and then yeah, dark photons, and uh, just because the force inside. Is, is left-handed instead of right-handed. And you would have an explanation of why these things don't shake hands. Um, normal matter and dark matter, or normal antimatter or with dark antimatter. You know, they don't shake hands because the force inside is different. It's just a key that doesn't fit. Um, I'm thinking maybe as a retirement project to work on some kind of uh, um, augmented Quaternion model is probably something like also with information theory because as you said we've we've sort of exhausted the the, the, the possibilities within a, a complex algebra to represent our matter and antimatter and spin and all these kind of things. So um, from a formal point of view, it would look the same, but at the same time, it would be a different beast. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking of how how can you formalize that. So have a look at that and um, and see if you like it or not. Uh, I'm at one hour and a half, so I will make some concluding remarks. They might really be concluding because my, my daughter and my son say, Dad, stop this nonsense uh, because you do think about it uh, a lot and it consumes a lot of time. That's true. At the same time, I think it's all fun. So I, I will say something because um, in my last slide on uh, something philosophical. Um, I get fan mail, uh, and I feel sometimes this fan mail is uh, is usually you know very nice and, and great, and uh, thank you, and keep sending stuff. Um, but some of the mails are or, or contacts I get is like like wow, um, you sort of solved the 
a half, if not more, 90% of the mystery and this and that. And then, um, so, so what is there beyond charges and fields? And, um, and sometimes it's also questions like, can we go beyond uh, the Planck scale and see what is there? My answer to that is very simple. No, you can't go beyond the Planck scale. You know? and, and these laws of nature dictate uh, at what scale uh, things work. So I don't think there's like layers and layers uh, of reality that we are um, that we will be peeling off. I, I do think we um, that will sound very arrogant that we do know it all in terms of uh, you know pure science. And uh, what is left is really applied applied science or engineering. I would say where. Uh, you know, we, we apply these models and we um, we see how they apply to very specific situations, which is not easy. You know, you can imagine a proton or an electron being forced through a slit, you know, the, the crystal structure, how they interact the fields and whatever, you know, finding a mathematical model for that, uh, how that stuff interferes, that, that's not easy. I think the, you know, in optics, you have the fresnel uh, Huygens uh, equations, which sort of... Um, uh, explain the near fields, the far fields, uh, and in between how you go from a discrete um, model of interaction to, you know, indeed densities and, and, and waves uh, instead from, you know, individual things, like photons interacting. And so we, we, we don't have these fresnel huygens equations for, um, for interference. We know from the pattern, as I see it, they must be there. It's sort of the same, but it's 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 a lot more complicated. But I said that's that's more um, that's not a, a mystery then anymore. It's just like uh, we we haven't managed yet to um, you know with these basic laws that we have to manage all of the complexity that is there. For me, this is a search that is uh, ended. You know, I said as I'm a hobbyist and I'm going like it can't be explained. It is there. I feel instinctively how this thing works. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't care if I, you know, and I'm not going to invest in that also. So like, okay, well, can you work it out into the slightest detail? You know, I'm, I'm one person, I have a day job, and um, I, I think that's basically the solution for your problem here. Uh, and that's it. And then just run with it. Um, I'm not in charge of investigating, you know, your uh, physics problem that you happen and that you think I can solve. Maybe I can but I just don't have physically the time. The second thing I want to say, and this is where this slide comes in. Sometimes I do feel, oh, what is your religion? Does God exist? Jesus Christ, does God exist? I don't know. I don't believe in God. I would say uh, I don't believe in God because God is, has been an abused concept. It's like love. Um, I do not believe in God, but I do believe in love. At the same time, if you will ask me, what is love? Well, you know, it's a concept we use for uh, probably, hopefully, a loving relationship with your partner that consists of many practical and emotional and, and other things and whatever. Love is sort of such a badly defined term. We have to believe in it. We have to believe in good and bad. We have, but, but it's, uh, you know, is love reality? That's sort of the same thing. Like, is, is everything energy? You know, it's a meaningless question for me. What do you mean with energy? Kinetic potential? Nuclear? Um, electromagnetic uh, so, so there's so much things you need to do and especially in science you know there's no grand concept unifying everything and the, the other thing is like um, you know what is reality then uh, i don't believe in ether theories my theory is not an ether theory i think charges and fields are fine as concepts and i'm not looking for something beyond that except for that question that i do want to solve like uh, pair creation and annihilation but, but one thing I want to say, and this is then, I would say, my grand worldview or my view on reality or um, everything is statistical determinism, uh, I would say. So I said we, we can't predict things because, you know, the velocities are so high there. We don't know the initial conditions of the system. We can never measure it um, because if we measure it, we actually disturb the system uh, because we measure photons with... Uh, you know, we measure the position of an electron by firing photons at it, so we disturb its position. You know, this is all quite mechanical. We, we're sort of at the limit of of, uh, of what we can measure there, and it's a physical limit, and it's part of the system we are studying. And so, the, for me, that's not a mystery, and I don't think there's anything beyond. I really think we, we've we've sort of hit that that wall, and but that wall is also you know reality. Well, what we are measuring is real. And that's another thing I want to say where people often get confused, like, yeah, but speed of light, quantum of action, elementary charge, these are absolute quantities and or the invariant argument of a wave function. Yeah, these are invariant quantities. They're the same. Does it mean that they are more real than the energy or 
you know, a distance interval that we measure or a mass factor or a force. I'm going like, no, it's, it's that, that's real as well. It's not because something is relative, that a measurement is relative, that it depends on your frame of reference, um, that it's not real. Uh, I said a lot of uh, things, you know, you, you start understanding it better when you, let's say, the electromagnetism. I, I prefer to see it in, uh, you know, uh, in, in variant equations, you know, the scalar or vector potential rather than the electric and magnetic field factor, because I know that that's sort of a representation of that electromagnetic force in my frame of reference. So I'd rather, you know, but that level of abstraction. Is a, is, a, is a choice uh, and I'm happy I can make this choice because I've studied the math that is required for it, but I'm never ever gonna say like, well, the electric force is not quite real because you know, if you look from another reference frame, the magnetic forms become bigger and you, you never end. Basically, reality is what we measure, what we see. And, uh, and so we combine these relative and absolute, I find it a really bad, uh, this is probably something that Einstein, I don't know, I don't have a better solution, but. Relativity theory is not about uh, everything is relative and or it's also not about what is real and what is not real. No, not at all. Um, relative and absolute com um, quantities combine in what we use to describe reality and that, that uh, a description, that's a mathematical description, Maxwell's equation, Schrodinger's, the Breuer's relation I said in, his, in this representation, which I don't particularly like, and the Planck-Einstein relation, etc. And, and so that's reality. And it's sort of um, any question that you would have on like, oh, what's beyond that? What's beyond these equations? Well, I'm going like, sorry, nothing. <laughs> it's like, this this is it. Uh, that's life. And, and uh, what is a miracle is that we can really imagine it, that we have these things that sort of completely describe the world and what is then the world uh you will ask well that is where i want to wittgenstein was a philosopher which i did not like i studied him um i was always surprised that you know such a genius that he wasn't in touch with you know special relativity theory as it was being an event he came out of for he was in touch with russell you know there was all these great things going on in physics and he doesn't write anything about it he just has these strange theory in his Tractatus Logica Philosophicus, but which makes sense that we should be able, we should be able to find an unambiguous language describing what he calls the Gesamtheit der Tatsachen, the facts. And facts are established also, you know, you measure something, my, my experiment does not yield the same result, we must find a way to, to resolve the problem because we must be measuring the same. And so if we don't measure the same, then it means that nature doesn't make any sense. So it must be in our measurements rather than uh, our measure. One of either your measurement is wrong or my measurement is wrong because nature cannot be wrong. Nature is what it is. So uh, he had a lot of great, you know, simple in a typically Anglo-Saxon way, pragmatic definition on what reality is. And that's what it is. The Gesamtheit, the Tatsache, nicht der Dinge. Uh, we don't need a lot of metaphysical concepts, you know, we just, uh, and that's the thing he was intrigued, we just, what is the language we use to describe it? And he thought in sort of an unambiguous uh, language was possible. And um, in his later, um, uh, latter half of his life, he didn't write anymore after TLP, he didn't, but there's letters and he doubts that, oh, you know, mathematics, even mathematics is, uh, is ambiguous. And he's right in that sense, because one symbol can mean many things. He probably got influenced by French philosophy there. Yeah, you need to agree on what a symbol means. So in that sense, it's not uh, unambiguous. It's not that you have a lambda there and everybody will know what it means. No, you need to explain what the lambda stands for and then sort of agree. And then there's a consensus on what it stands for. And then you can start using it in equations. But the language is then uh, unambiguous. So it's kind of funny that the, the later Wittgenstein sort of turned back on his uh, original idea that you know, yeah, we we can capture reality in these uh, in these in this mathematical language, in that formalism, and then said, well, later and maybe no. Um, so I think he got lost there. Uh, I didn't get lost, but I, I do believe that his original ideas uh, philosophically make sense when you start thinking about um, metaphysics, really, and uh, what is what, and what is world, and what is reality, and what is God, and um, does God exist? Well, it's just like, um, well, analyze your own question a little bit better, uh, come up with better definitions, and then maybe you'll find the answer for yourself. Um, so that's my farewell, I would say, uh, to physics, to this hobby. 
Um, I've had a lot of fun with it, but I also would say like uh, it's, at points it has been depressing in the sense that I got a lot of pushback. Um, people don't like to sort of say like, well, this is common wisdom, but is it wise and is it common? Uh, so I've been seen a little bit as a challenger. The funny thing is, as I said in my last video, is uh, I actually think with this thing, with these things, I'm a lot more mainstream than um, than most think. I, I, I actually think I'm more mainstream than you know some of the established ac academics who continue to sort of say, like, you know, the Higgs boson and the Higgs field, and the, that is real. You know, we don't have any primary evidence for it. We have two protons clashing and then in the end, you know, two gamma rays or uh, four, or four, two pairs of gamma rays coming out of it and then these unstable. And so the theory that must explain this is this collection of virtual particles and and now we need sort of a, a mass generating mechanism and I'm going like, no, you don't need that. What I have here is uh, will do. So people don't like that um, and that has been um, uh, tough. Um, but at the same time, uh, that's also the reason why I, uh, I'm happy. I'm not a professional um, uh, physicist, not an academic. Uh, I can search for the truth. I can speak my mind. And uh, it may be a, a happier person uh, because I do believe now that uh, I, I found what I was looking for is sort of a, oh yeah, and they're gonna say, this is an explanation of reality. If you ask me, you know, what is there? What are we made of, so to speak? Uh, well, this is it. And then the most amazing thing is that it made me appreciate, um, you know, how amazing our mind is. The fact that we can imagine these things, um, that we have that knowledge, uh, that, that I found a most amazing thing. And that tends to refer to another um, philosopher, Hegel, actually. I, I do see, sort of see, you know, mankind becoming... Uh, smarter. I will not say they are becoming any wiser. We live in a difficult international situation with the war. And I know I've, I've served in Afghanistan. I was briefly in Ukraine. It's very sad. Politics is very sad. It's not rational. But in the field of uh, culture, um, uh, intellect, uh, thinking, science, uh, we moved so much over the past decades. I said the discovery of dark matter in itself is, I was going like, wow. Uh, see how many things are still hidden out there but you know it had to be there <laughs> so now it's there and that's for me the last one also with the, with you know the discovery of the fact that gravitational waves that uh, the effect of let's say uh, matter and antimatter uh, annihilating each other at a very large scale in the universe and that we can measure that thing and then we say like oh well Einstein was right uh, the the effect of that thing, uh, the structuring of space, you know, the, this gravitational wave, we can measure it, and and that wave, that gravitational wave, uh, comes. Um, said I don't want to go into gravitation. Uh, for me, it's it's more like that has to do with structure. There, I would refer. I have one paper on on uh, the finite universe, as I call it, where I challenge a number of uh, questions uh, because they're not sensical, and where I give answers also to questions on on cosmological question of cosmogeny as they call the origin of the universe I think like well probably it's something like that and that's um, probably not mainstream but very logical very rational and at least you know it will um, give you some material where you can think like okay fine he this Jean-Louis, he, he makes me think and uh, what he says makes sense or doesn't make sense. It will allow you to become a happier person because um, we, we are just made that way. We are analytical beasts. Um, that's how we survive. That's how we multiply. We have a capacity to analyze a threat. Uh, and uh, 10,000 years ago, we have a capacity to sort of go be very rational about the situation that happens and puts us in danger. And so applying that brain power to things like this, which are playing for fun, is fun, and it will make you a happier person. I became a happier person because of it. So um, I will leave it at that. Um, I hope you, uh, well, judging from the, the dropout rate uh, to my videos, probably you're not watching anymore, but it's like a 5% retention rate. Uh, so if you're among these 5% who, who are still watching me, I would say thank you very much and uh, have fun with it. Um, Think it over, think for yourself, and find find your own truth, I would say. Uh, I have found mine. Uh, maybe it's not necessarily yours. Uh, and I'm a happy person. And um, think and 
try to see the positive side of it. Don't don't fall into the trap of an Eden Fest and well, you know, I'm not famous. Well, I will never be famous. But I had fun with doing this, and, uh, and so I just want to, you know, if you're listening and watching, you're probably an amateur like me, and think like, oh, okay, fine. Um, at least, you know, he takes some of the the, the guru the guru style of physics, uh, you know, away, um, which which is um, which, which I think is is necessary. There's uh, too many lies in our society and politics already. Um, so um, thank you and have a nice day.